Hello Internet and welcome to The Collective Arcana. We're a channel all about tabletop gaming and today we're going to continue our series on the Pathfinder 2E character classes. We are up to Cleric now and uh, I would like to uh, apologize beforehand if you hear the purring of this little one or any noise she makes. Uh, it, I had to hold her to keep her from yelling because she's a Siamese. <laughs> so the Cleric is the quintessential healer uh, of, of a party. Now, we've talked before in some other videos about how the way that the healing skill works, as well as uh, champions uh, and uh, alchemists and, and other classes like that, having abilities to fill a slot if you're missing a cleric. So in Pathfinder 2e, a cleric is definitely not as necessary as it is in other editions. Um, with that said, it's still the best at what it does, and what it does is in-combat healing. Uh, a uh, life oracle from the Advanced Player's Guide, and we'll talk about that uh, when we get there alphabetically, um, but a life oracle could probably give a cleric a run for its money, um, but that healing font and all the different feats that the cleric gets is pretty hard to argue with and overcome in a, just a, a straight heal off. So what we're going to do uh, is, like always, we're just going to go down the list and start with the initial proficiencies that the class gets and, and everything you get sort of at level one and how it progresses. So clerics get eight hit points per level, um, and they their boosted stat is, or ability score, I should say, is wisdom, which is very fitting. That's what your uh, spell casting is going to scale off of, so that's why. Clerics are trained at perception beginning at level 1, and that goes up to Expert at level 5, combined with your High Wisdom modifier, and you're going to uh, have pretty good uh, perception and initiative. Your Fortitude save uh, begins trained, and uh, for reasons that we will get into when we start talking about doctrines, uh, will not progress naturally, but I promise it will. Your Reflex save begins trained and goes to Expert at level 11, and your will save begins expert and goes to master at level 9. You begin trained in spell attacks and DCs, uh, as well as trained in simple and unarmed attacks. Um, you also are automatically trained in your deity's favored weapon, which of course varies by deity. You also begin trained in religion, plus one skill determined by your deity, and then additional skills equal to two plus your intelligence modifier. You begin trained in unarmored, and that progresses to expert at level 13. And if that seems a little light on progression and initial proficiencies, you're correct, uh, and that's because of what we're going to go into next, and those are doctrines. Doctrines are essentially the subclasses of cleric. Right now we have two. We have the cloistered cleric and the war priest. They both appear in the core rulebook. No new ones were added in the advanced player's guide, but I do expect to see at least one more get added eventually, um, possibly an inquisitor or something entirely different. But for now we have the cloistered cleric, which is a very light armored, it's a classic white mage if you, you know, uh, play old Final Fantasy games and things like that. It's a light armored, or no armored, rather, uh, divine caster. And then the war priest, which is a much more martial, sort of, for some people it might be the traditional cleric, if you're coming from Pathfinder 1e or D&D 5e, where it's a character that gets medium armor, uh, some weapon proficiencies, and things like that. We almost did two separate videos for the Cloister Cleric and the War Priest because they are extremely different in terms of playstyle based on how they progress. Now, by the time you get to level 20, there's really not a whole lot different, but because the War Priest's martial abilities advance so much faster and they get such different martial proficiencies versus the Cloistered Cleric, uh, it was sort of touch and go for me on how I wanted to do it. Um, I decided to just do it this way break down the, the standard proficiencies and progression, and then go into uh, each doctrine, just because I think it's somehow less confusing <laughs> that way. So let's go ahead and start with the Cloistered Cleric. So the Cloistered Cleric doctrine, uh, each, each uh, doctrine gets uh, 
these edicts called doctrines. And so the first one for Cloistered Cleric gives you the domain initiate feat, allowing you to uh, select a domain related to your deity and then gain a focus spell uh, from that domain. They're very thematic. Uh, there are several of them in the core rulebook and uh, the Gods and Magic book almost doubled it, I want to say. Added a, quite a few more anyway. So there's plenty to choose from. Most deities are going to have at least two domains associated with them, some more. Um, and when we get to the feat section, we'll talk about feats to allow you to have access to additional domains or uh, improve your access within the domain you've already chosen. It's interesting to note that even a war priest can pick up the domain initiate feat. It is an option. It's just free for the cloistered cleric at level one. Your second doctrine, and that comes in at third level, uh, gives you a expert in fortitude saves. Your third doctrine at level seven um, gives you expert in spell attacks and DCs, and that's going to start, you're going to see those increase and keep pace with most full casters in the system. At level 11, you'll get your fourth doctrine, and this gives you expert proficiency and the critical specialization with your deity's favored weapon. Uh, that's the end of your combat progression in terms of uh, weapon attacks with a cloistered cleric, um, and it's not great. You, you functionally are trained with one uh, weapon that either is a simple weapon or is a martial weapon that you otherwise wouldn't have any access to. Um, just not stellar. <laughs> um, but you are expert with it, so uh, which is keeping on par with most casters. Your fifth doctrine comes at level 15, and that gives you master proficiency with your spells, uh, attack, and DCs. And your final doctrine gives you legendary proficiency with your spells and attack DCs, and that comes at 19th level. Um, again, that progression is very similar to most every caster in the game. Uh, you know, I'm saying that I'm talking about bards, wizards, druids, uh, things of that nature. <clears throat> so not terribly surprising in those proficiencies. And uh, we'll get into the rest of what you get with your class once we cover uh, what comes with the War Priest doctrines. So the War Priest is much more martially focused, and like most marshals, uh, we're going to get a lot of stuff out of the gate. So the War Priest will be trained in light and medium armor, uh, and they will become immediately experts in fortitude saves. They gain the shield block special reaction uh, bonus feat. Um, and if their deity's favored weapon is a simple weapon, they get deadly simplicity, which increases the damage die size of your, of your weapon if it's a simple weapon. Additionally, at level 13, when your uh, armored defenses go up to expert uh, for you, that will include light armor and medium armor. So, so the war priest is getting that better armor progression and they are getting, uh, you know, a great, a great reaction with a shield, and they're getting a little more damage with most simple weapons, or, uh, as we'll see in a later doctrine, more variety of weapons that they can use. Second doctrine, again at level three, is going to make you trained in martial weapons. So every single martial weapon is now open to you. Um, you know, you're still not gonna, you're still possibly might be using that deity's favored weapon just for the increased damage size, but it really opens you up to a lot more types of traits and therefore a lot more fighting styles. So it's great, great boon for a frontliner. Your third doctrine coming in at level seven is going to give you expert with your favored weapon, and it's going to give you critical specialization with your favored weapon. Um, so now we've seen that favored weapon take off ahead of uh, regular martial weapons again, unless your favorite weapon's a martial weapon. Uh, what that means is that you're once again probably going to be relying on that favored weapon, but you're still, still potentially could be using those martial weapons as well. Your fourth doctrine at level 11 is when your spell attacks finally go up, and that's four levels behind when most spellcasters get it. Um, and this is, you know, really one of the reasons why uh, people are not super keen on War Priest in term, if you're expecting a game to go all the way to level 20. Um, low levels, it's fine. 
especially up until level 7, you're really only doing better than the uh, Cloistered Cleric. But here, with the spell proficiencies being so much slower, that's when you start to see the downside of getting all that extra stuff at level 1. So your uh, spell attacks and DCs, just getting to Expert at level 11. For your fifth Doctrine, your Fortitude saves are going to go up to Master. And then finally, at level 19, your spell saves and DCs are going to go to Master as well. Um, you know, that's the level when most casters are getting Legendary and you're just getting Master. So you really are basically a full step behind other, other casters. Um, we'll get into when we do our final, our final reviews, how I feel about that. Um, everybody's gonna have their own, their own opinions, of course, but I'll sort of give you my thought process on why I think that's not as bad as a lot of people might say. So those are the doctrines aside, but that's not all you get. It's almost <laughs> all you get as a cleric. Um, so you'll also, of course, get a deity that's gonna determine your favorite weapon, which is, you know, brought up in your doctrines a lot. Um, it's also going to determine, uh, your bonus spells that get added to your spell list. So a lot of those spells are going to be not on your, they'll either be uh, uncommon or rare even, I think possibly, spells from the spell list. So spells that not all clerics would get access to, you get guaranteed access to. They might even also be spells from other traditions. So spells that normally are not even divine spells. Uh, it specifically states that if you get a spell that's not normally in the divine tradition, you cast it as if it was part of the tra divine tradition. So you treat it just like any other spell, even if it's something like Fireball that is not normally divine at all. It's just another third level spell for you. In addition to the spells, your deity will give you a certain anathema that's thematic and based on your deity. Again, uh, about 20 of them appear in the core rulebook, and the Deities and Demigods book adds so many more. Um, you don't get as much. Uh, we talked about that in that video. Definitely check it out if you're going to be playing a cleric. Um, even if you're not playing in the world of Galarian, um, you know, most of those deities... There's about 200 total where they give you the bare minimum, just anathema, weapon, uh, and things like that, so that you can just slot it in and fill it in. And so if you just want, if you're just making a homebrew pantheon, uh, or just want to give your cleric some options, I can't recommend that book enough. Um, but anyway, so you'll get um, those anathema. And they can vary quite a bit. I'm not going to bother going into them because they're all so very different. Uh, one thing to keep track of is that typically speaking, a good deity, it's going to be anathema to cast any spell that has an evil trait and vice versa. If you have an evil deity, it's going to be anathema to cast any spell with a good trait. You'll also be trained in that one additional skill that we talked about um, and your deity's favorite weapon, of course. Then you have the big... The big thing, the reason you play a cleric if you want to be a healer is Divine Font. Um, and I say if you want to be a healer, but Divine Font can, can also be used for blasters. So what it does is it gives you an additional number of spell slots at your highest possible spell level that you have access to. So if you're a third level caster, second level spells. If you're a fifth level caster, third level spells, so on. And it gives you... Uh, additional slots equal to one plus your charisma modifier that you can only use to prepare either heal or harm spells. Which you prepare will be determined by your deity. Some deities will let you choose which one it is, but you have to make that choice typically at level one and you can't go back. So a lot of neutral deities will do that. And so what that means is functionally you have extra spell slots at your highest level. Um, if you're the party healer, that means you have more room in your normal prepared slots to, to have access to more utility options, uh, buffs, basically the, the more fun spells uh, without having to look at your party and say, sorry guys, I don't have any healing today. <laughs> um, so, so that's really nice. It's a great quality of life improvement where you're not spending those precious, pre precious prepared slots um, on the things that the party's expecting you to be doing to fill your role. Um, but at the same time, you've still got those options. Um, so it's a great, it's a great balance there. 
Um, I like it a lot better than the old version where you could spontaneously drop a spell to replace it with heal just because it's um, guaranteed higher level. And it removes that feeling of, you know, sometimes you'd be in a fight in, in first edition Pathfinder or in other editions of the game where you'd have a great spell that you think is going to be handy, but all of a sudden that heal is now necessary and you don't have that, that moment of, of anguish and pain going, well, so much for that spell. Let's, let's heal the, the barbarian. Um, so it's nice. It's, I think it's a great, a great class feature. Now, as I said, if you're an evil character or, an, or if you have an evil deity or a neutral deity and you choose the harm option, uh, all of a sudden now you are a, you have pretty reliable high level blasting options for most living enemies. And that's very nasty <laughs> to be able to hit people with, uh, several free high level harms per day. Um, it's definitely a great, a great, uh, damage build for a class that's not maybe always known for being a high damage class. That's really about it in terms of your base progression. Um, it seems like there's not really a lot there because there sort of isn't. Uh, your doctrines really, you know, cover a lot of stuff, but a lot of that is just your basic, uh, saves and, and attacks and things progression. But that, uh, but the deity, the, um, the, uh, font is very powerful. Uh, and you are a full caster. And, uh, you know, so we'll, we'll get into what the feats do. I think that that's really where clerics start to shine is, uh, that they have some comparatively really powerful feats. Not necessarily in terms of, of turning a whole, a whole tide of a fight, but compared to a lot of casters where, uh, their feats are really pretty general purpose, the cleric's feats really hone in on those tasks that they might be that they're expected to be doing, while still leaving plenty of room for stranger builds. So, just gonna kind of run down a list with just some, again, I'm not gonna do uh, individual feats, like, it's just, you know, I want you to, to read through there and find them, just to give you an overview of the types of things you'll see when you're looking through feats. Uh, you're gonna see things to gain uh, additional focus spells, either advancing a domain you already have, possibly getting access to other domains, or just uh, some other focus spells. Uh, you're going to find new ways to use that divine font. So new things, uh, com like completely new things that you can do with it, um, or just ways to modify how you use it. Like there's a great one so that whenever you cast uh, an area effect version of channel, uh, whether it's heal or harm, instead of it being a uh, radius around you, a burst, you can create it as a cone or even a line. Uh, that's really good if you have a hallway full of undead approaching, um, or, you know, if you just don't have a lot of allies near you, but they're all over there. So that's a really, really awesome one. Um, and that's what I was talking about when they have these really powerful options. Yes, it's limited to healer harm, but it's not limited to your font, which means that any other healer harm spells that you have prepared work with this, not just your font, which is very cool. And if you think about like, you know, if you were playing a sorcerer, and it said, and there was a feat that said, okay, you can reshape one of your signature spells. That's strong. So um, there's also options to change your action economy around heal or harm. Uh, for example, uh, you can get the effects of the three action by only using two actions, for example. If you still prefer to use the two action, you can, because uh, the two action is a very, very powerful heal. Um, there's also ones where you can charge your weapon with divine power. Uh, you can add magical effects, temporary magical effects to weapons and armor. Uh, you can add uh, additional boons to targets that you heal, including adding regeneration or fast healing five to any target who uh, was downed or even dead. And then you, you either raise them from the dead or uh, get them healing back on their feet. So now in addition to that flat, that burst of healing they get, Initially, they're getting five healing every round, which is just very strong and a great way to not have to keep hitting that character over and over to keep them up, theoretically. Um, there's also uh, options to command undead, and at level 20, in addition to getting the extra 10th level spell slot and things like that, 
Uh, you have the ability to become a lesser herald of your deity and actually uh, functionally use the commune spell without a chance of failure. In fact, you always critically succeed, and everyone that hears you speak inherently knows that you are speaking for your deity. <laughs> so really cool stuff, really thematic things as well, um, and also very, very powerful things. Um, it's a great class. Um, so in overview, uh, I think that the Cloistered Cleric is obviously very powerful. If what you're looking for is the traditional uh, healer, then you really can't beat it. It's rock solid. Uh, the spell list and the feats are all about keeping a party uh, at its best. And in terms of in-combat healing is very tough to beat. Again, the Life Oracle could probably give it a run for its money, but uh, I think that those extra slots and the ways that you can stack up those effects on healing are are very strong. Uh, additionally, having the option to play as a necromancer and, you know, raising dead, healing undead, uh, things like that, commanding in de <laughs> undead that you encounter, uh, and of course the, the harm, all those great effects. Uh, it's a very unique thing right now. It's something that other classes can't quite do, even other casters. A lot of people, depending on, on where you get most of your, your fantasy ideas from, might think of wizards as being necromancers, but uh, the cleric is really, really good at that job. Um, and I imagine we're going to see that expanded on as we continue. The war priest is definitely in sort of a weirder spot. It doesn't quite get the uh, weapon and attack or attack and defense proficiencies that you'd want from a full frontliner, uh, but it's also getting full 10th level spell access, so it sh probably shouldn't. Um, it gets them early enough and will sort of keep pace with a lot of the frontliners. Uh, you're, sp you're really looking at sort of keeping pace with like a, a ruffian rogue type of a class where you know you're not going to be the best anywhere but you will be so you'll be very solid um it does sort of fall off i mean those progressions stop at level 13 uh and it would be nice if they continued or if there was some optional way to continue either with class or general feats but uh overall i think especially if you're playing in a campaign that you don't expect to last past level 7 it's a no brainer um but anything even into mid levels i th i think it still keeps up fairly well after about level 14, you may find yourself regretting not picking Cloistered Cleric. Um, but, but with that said, I still think that, uh, the War Priest is a very strong class. I mean, anything that gets 10th level spells is gonna be fine. Um, even in this where spells are a little downplayed. Yes, your saves and DCs and your attack rolls and things are gonna be low, but that's just gonna force you to play buffs, especially self buffs. Uh, so you're going to be able to, with those spells, potentially make up for a lot of those limitations you have in your proficiencies and, and training levels um, to be a very potent frontline caster that still, or frontline fighter type class that still gets access to those healing fonts and all the plethora of feats to improve that. So for people coming from Pathfinder 5e or even uh, our D&D 5e or Pathfinder 1e, uh, who, when you look at the champion, you think, oh man, I, I really wanted to be this, uh, I really wanted to be this frontline, divinely powered, uh, you know, sort of hybrid spellcaster warrior. I think the war priest is going to be the way to do that. Um, it's, it's gets, it gets a lot of great ways to apply, uh, heal and harm spells into attacks and things like that, and a lot of ways to keep yourself running healing yourself while also healing party members with feats, which are, to be fair, also open to the Cloistered Cleric, but you're probably going to get more use out of those feats uh, as a war priest. So, you know, even when you're healing an ally, you're, you're also charging yourself up to stay there in the front lines. Um, I think it really can work very well. It's probably not optimal. Like I said, if you know that your, your character is going to go to level 20, you may feel better off being a champion who dedicates into... Uh, cleric, you'll have fewer spell slots, they won't go up as high, but your mastery will go up just as high and you'll have a lot more frontline capabilities. Um, so I think that could be a way to go if that's what you're trying to do. Um, but the War Priest is definitely still a great class. 
Overall, Cleric does its job very well, um, as should be expected, as I'm sure we all uh, thought it would. Uh, you're definitely still getting exactly what you think you're going to get. Your domains, uh, if you play into those, are going to give you really thematic abilities that fit whatever deity you choose. Uh, and then there's a lot of very potent feats for whatever type of uh, fighting style uh, you end up going with, even outside of your, or your doctrine. It's a really fun class. I don't really, I don't really think that there's much to change, even if I, I wanted to homebrew something. Um, the flavor you can get from those domain spells is really interesting as well. It makes for huge, wide options for characters. Uh, when we get to the Oracle, of course, I'll, I'll do a little more of a deep dive, uh, on the, on the comparisons between the two because they can really fill similar roles, uh, as well as a divine, uh, sorcerer. Um, but I still think that my money is still on the cleric in terms of raw, uh, support and healer output, especially because the, uh, life cleric can, or the life oracle can sort of hurt itself a little bit in terms of, uh, options. So it might need a little more upkeep from the whole party to pay for its potentially higher healing. Um, but that is the cleric. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, gets you interested in playing them. Um, but again, you don't need to because the class or the system does such a good job of giving you other options. Uh, while the cleric is the, is probably the best in combat healer in, for my money, a champion is probably the better out of combat healer in terms of making sure that your party, uh, or the champion is the better out of combat healer, uh, to make sure that your party is up at full health in between fights. But anyone with the medicine skill or an alchemist who chooses the chirurgeon, uh, uh, discipline or subclass is going to be, uh, able to, to fill that role as well. So that's the cleric. That's it, I promise. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Uh, don't forget to like, subscribe if you have any questions. If you do want us to, you know, go over, uh, some of the, uh, deities or things like that, we, we certainly can. Just, you know, let us know what, uh, what questions you have or what you want to see. And, uh, Druid is next. And, uh, we hope to have these coming out a little bit more regularly. I've got some time off work coming up to try to churn out some of these and make sure that we're not you know, always a couple weeks between them. So thanks for your patience. Thanks so much for watching and welcome to the collective. We'll see you next time.